Jan, if you can hear me, you could um, 
uh, turn your sound on, we can actually talk over Zoom while we're waiting. Hi, Gary. Hi there. How you doing? <laughs> I has I hesitate to have my sound on because. I have two little dogs that like to bark a lot, <laughs> and sometimes it's really distracting. So that's why I do not have my my sound on. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, mute everybody's microphones just as I start the uh, the presentation talk itself. So don't worry. I have a little dog who tends to bark as well. So uh, well, maybe they'll bark together. They'll hear each other. <laughs> I think I've probably been quite close to where you live. I've been to uh, Minneapolis and I headed west out of Minneapolis on a, on a ride I was doing around the USA. I'm trying to remember where though. Let me have a look and see if, if, headed, I can... if you headed out of Minneapolis West, you were probably on Highway 212. I'm not sure. Let me see if I can work it out where I was. And you would have gone through a town called Eden Prairie. I was on 212. I went through Glencoe, Olivia and on to Granite Falls. <laughs> yes. Well, my daughter lives in Glencoe. All ah, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, nice um, drive. Nice. It's, it's pretty out here. Yeah. Yeah. And where are you? I'm just north of London in the UK. Oh, I would love to be where you are. <laughs> Maybe not at the moment you wouldn't be, but uh, uh, um, but uh, well, in in better times, yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Right now, nobody's going anywhere. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, it, so that, does it not depend where you are in the US? Um, mm -hmm. I've I've heard reports that things. Uh, the lockdown is different in different parts of the US. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. If you've, if you've ever been to the United States, I don't think people realize how huge the country is. Oh, I, I certainly know. I did a, um, <laughs> I did a 21,000 mile ride around the USA back in 2010. Well, then you know, but I think a lot of people you know, they think they're comparing the United States to, say, France. And they don't read, you know, when they start looking at the numbers of people that are involved with the, the corona and that sort of thing. Yeah. And they don't realize how many, you know, millions of people live here. It's 330 million. Is that right? It's a lot of people. Yeah. But there are places where you can go for 300 miles and there's nothing. Oh, I've been there. I've uh, <laughs> I've been <laughs> to Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> You've been to Nebraska? <laughs> well, anybody who would take a trip to the United States and go to Nebraska has got some major problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. <laughs> yeah, Nebraska is, you just go through Nebraska. Yeah. You don't ever go to Nebraska. Yeah, as I left, uh, it was quite funny, as I left, um, Oh, Lincoln, Nebraska, and headed east. My GPS told me to turn left in 256 miles. That made me laugh. Well, if you were in Lincoln and you went, which direction are you going? I went east? west out of Lincoln. West out of Lincoln. Yeah. yeah, you'd be in the middle of, yeah, no place you really want to be. I was in the middle of nowhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but, but then if you went another couple hundred miles west and then went a little bit south, you'd be in a pretty cool place. Where would that be? You'd be in Colorado. Oh, I did. Um, how many miles did I do in Colorado? One second. I did uh, 2,700 miles in Colorado. Colorado is a beautiful, beautiful place. Oh, it most certainly is. Yeah. Yeah, I've got quite a few friends uh, from Colorado. Absolutely love the place. Well, in the United States, we've got just about every kind of climate you can even imagine. Yeah. 
So, and a lot of people, you know, they say you live in Minnesota. Are you out of your mind? Yeah, Even cool. the people cool. in the United right. States yeah. think Minnesota. They think we live in caves. They don't believe that there's actually cities here, you know. <laughs> whenever, whenever I, if I happen to be in the southern United States, people will say to me, oh, you've got to be from Minnesota. You've got such an accent. Yeah. I don't think I have an accent at all. <laughs> uh, you, have, you don't have a very strong accent, no. No. Well, we pronounce all of our vowel sounds. Yeah. So that's why why we sound the way we sound. <laughs> yeah. 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 And we come a lot of us from the Scandinavian countries. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of oof does and use guys and <laughs> you know funny euphemisms that we say. But yeah, I personally really like the accent of the the UK. I think you people sound great. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we have quite a range of, even though we're a very small country, we have quite a range of accents here. You, know, you might not notice them, but your people from here certainly notice them. You know, anything from you know, Irish to Scotland to Welsh. You know, even you know, when I first started working, on, you know, I live in London. When I first started working, I, I moved about just 90 miles west of London. And there's even an accent there. It's very strange. What do you ride, Jen? What do I ride? Yeah. As far as, as bikes are concerned? Yes. Um, I don't have one of my own, but my son is a major, huge, 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 huge Harley nut. And his significant other lives breathes drinks sleeps harley <laughs> the girl is just i mean their house is like a harley museum it's crazy yeah. yeah but my son has a harley oh he's gonna kill me it's a dyna super glide okay yeah it's an fx dci should I get that wrong, I'd be in big trouble. <laughs> well, well done. Well done. But he also used to work for Harley Davidson, and so he uh, he uh, has quite a funny story about how he ended up with his bike. Oh, really? And what's that? I don't know if you want me to keep chatting here, but when he first started out with bikes, he was basically had about two dollars in his pocket. And he had an old pickup truck, and he he traded the pickup truck for a little Honda, I don't know, a little Sportster, or some little tiny little bike. Yeah. And he rode that thing for a long time. And whenever he had repairs on it needed, he would go into the local little Honda dealership. Yeah. And one day, and, and they knew, the people at the Honda place knew, that he worked for Harley Davidson. And they used to really tease him about it. Oh, I'm sure they did. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, you ride what you can afford to ride. Yeah. So, anyways, long story short, one day he walked into the Honda dealership and here's this bike. And he thought, wow, if I could pick any Harley Davidson, this is the bike I would want. Yeah. Well, the price tag on it was outrageous. And he said, why do you have this Harley Davidson in a Honda dealership? That's pretty dumb. Yeah. And they said, well, it came in as a trade-in, blah, blah, de, blah. So anyway, he said, well, I can't afford it. So that was the end of that conversation. So a few weeks later, he was at work, and he's a mechanic. And he said that a trailer pulled in. And it was from the Honda dealership. And out of the back of this trailer comes this bike. The exact one. Yeah. He said, I almost killed myself running into the sales guy's office. <laughs> he said, I told him, I want that bike. I don't care. I got to have that bike. Well, what they did is the Honda dealership traded the Harley de dealership 
for a Honda that they had taken in. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So it anyway, cool. yeah. He, he went in and he talked to the salespeople. He ended up getting that bike for three thousand dollars. Very good. He did just it. It was just amazing. Just amazing. He just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and it needed it needed to be cleaned up and all of those sorts of things. Oh yeah. So uh, he ended up with a very nice bike for a really reasonable price. Excellent. He's and been riding it ago, ever since. How long ago was that? That was about mm, what four or five years ago. Okay. And does he still have it? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So he. I told him when he first got it, I said, you have to give me a ride. He said, I'm not giving anybody a ride. But he had a friend come over, and the friend has a, has a Harley, too. And he let the friend give me a ride. Oh, good. <laughs> Why wasn't he so, going to give you a ride? I didn't. Th I don't think he trusted himself enough to oh, do okay, that. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But anyways, so the only time that I've actually ridden is when I've been on a bike with somebody else. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. I like it. It's fun. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a few Harleys, so I'm uh, I'm quite lucky because I I run a um, a Harley Davidson motorcycle touring company. I have um, you know I have three uh harleys that i use for work and then i have a couple of my of my own so how cool yeah well you probably have the great big touring bikes though yes yeah yeah not the not the largest ones the largest ones are called ultras mm -hmm. uh, but, right. uh, i do my my work riding on street glides it's a big mm -hmm. touring bike but it's not the biggest one that you can get it's, are they uh, a little probably a little more comfortable you know as are. far as the long range riding goes oh much much more comfortable yeah 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 we do um yeah we on average we will do something like two thousand miles on one of our tours in europe um you know over uh ten or twelve days so um so you you want something reasonably comfortable yeah, otherwise it'd be pretty hard to walk after 12 days <laughs> riding on some of those bikes. <laughs> I've got a particularly uncomfortable Harley as well. It looks good, but it's not comfortable. And um, after you get off that for riding for quite a long time, it's not easy to walk. But uh, um, it's much better to have something comfortable. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So have you always lived in um, Minnesota? Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, I lived in Portland, Oregon for about three months. <laughs> that's where my wife is from. Oh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> Oregon is probably my, I would have to say almost probably my favorite state. Oregon is so incredibly beautiful. Yeah it's um i've been to i think 28 states and um the one that i've never been to is oregon where my wife was born so. oh, it is so and it's just so so beautiful there hmm. what i love is you can be in the mountains in the morning and you can be on the seashore in the afternoon yeah I'm trying to remember the name of the big river that flows through Columbia. Ah, uh, that's it. Yeah. 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 When I was there, I lived right on the Columbia river. Yeah. That's pretty spectacular too. Yeah. Yeah. So I understand. Hmm. Of course, I, I've realized that I um, have made a bit of a mistake with this talk um, because it being um, Memorial Day weekend, I don't know, will many of people have traveled this weekend if they can? Um, I guess it kind of depends on where you live because different states have different rules 
as far as what the restrictions are. Yeah. Here in Minnesota, they've lifted some of the restrictions recently so that people are able to move about a little bit better. So, yeah. um, some places like restaurants and things like that are still kind of locked down, but hopefully now the 1st of June, they're supposed to lighten up on some of that too. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it's just a matter of, you know, trying to kind of get back into it and see what happens. It's yeah. kind of scary, but yeah. You know, people have to get on with their lives the best that they they can and Absolutely. Mm. And I don't know about in in England, but here it's in the United States, it seems as though this is targeting really the the senior population. And it's concerning to me to figure out why you know how this this virus got into uh, seniors' residences in nursing homes and things yeah, like we're, that. We're having versus... we're having exactly the same here. Let me just say hello to uh, Albert. Hi, Albert. How are you? Oh, hi. Pretty good. Very good. And, and my husband has informed me. My rights. You and this person can't this moment. Am I in? Yep. Hi, John. How are you? Hey. Fine, how are you doing? I'm pretty good. <clears throat> oh, Albert, you're in your car. I am. Very good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm only going to be with you a short while. I have another appointment. So. And whereabouts are you, Albert? I live in Toronto, Canada. What yeah. What if she's in a blockout? Was a white yeah. blockout? Very good. Very good. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how I uh, contacted you guys. Maybe I saw you at a trade show. Did you do a trade show in Toronto? No. No? Oh, okay. No. But, but you organize tours in Europe. Maybe. Yes. That yeah. And that's what tonight's talk is about, about, you know, what people could expect and, you know, if they ever rode in Europe and what it's like and... Um, there was some, uh, right. some ideas. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Pat. How you doing? Good deal. Good, good. And whereabouts are you, Pat? A uh, little town in Alberta, Canada. Yeah, I've never been to Alberta, but uh, I'm sure I will one day. <laughs> yeah, the Rocky Mountains are, are a nice ride, but the rest is pretty flat. Yeah, yeah. What little town? Which little town? Elk Point. Is that by Calgary? Uh, nope. Calgary is oh. about a five-hour drive from here. South or north? Southeast, or sorry, southwest from here. Okay, okay. I was out in Calgary last summer. First week of August. I'm from nice Toronto. There. Yeah. And uh, we actually shipped our bikes to Calgary. We're from Toronto area. Yeah. And then we rode south to um, Wyoming and South Dakota. Oh, nice. Pretty cool. That'd be a nice route. Pretty... Yeah, so I'm sure you've gone that route down that way. Have you? Uh, not yet. One day. Yellowstone, Yellowstone Park and that. It was really beautiful. I've been there. I've been there on my British uh, Road King that I shipped over to the US. So, uh, yeah. So I've ridden around. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I love that area. Just the uh, the top of the yeah. Rockies in the US. Um, I just wish I'd gone a little bit further into the Rockies into Canada. Yeah, it's a beautiful ride out there. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to start in about five minutes. We'll just give a few other people a chance to uh, to connect. Um, How many people you got in tonight? Well, um, I think I've made a mistake um, uh, because I did it this weekend. I don't. I, I'd forgotten when I set the date that this was uh, Memorial Weekend in the U.S. So yeah, it's um, a holiday. So. Yeah, so um, it perhaps was not the wisest of choice. So I think about twenty-five signed up. Ah, oh, that's cool. I've had, um, the most I've had uh, is 77 on these talks. That, that was quite oh, a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's like, uh, like 
in the uh, upper right hand corner, I got a looks like a picture that might be a person, but it isn't. It's like a blank photo. Uh, I, What's I, the reason for that? I should be able to sort that out when we start. I'll. Uh, you should. Is uh, that supposed to be me? No, it will eventually when I set it up. It will be me. Because I'm seeing. Uh, the other people when they talk. Yeah, that's okay. That's all right. I'll 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 work that out. <laughs> hey, Brad, how are you? Can you hear me, Brad? I think you've got. Sorry, I was muted. I'm fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, good. Whereabouts are you, Brad? Central Oregon. Mm. That Ooh. Bend area. Yeah, I, uh, I was just talking to uh, Jan about Portland, Oregon, before you all came online. Yeah, that's a different country. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's um, I've been to quite a few uh, states in the U.S. I think twenty eight, but I've never been to Port. I've never been to Oregon, despite the fact that that's my wife, where my wife was born. So I must put that well, right one year. So Portland is um, in the valley, very wet, uh, high average annual rainfall. We're over in the high desert, uh, much drier, great motorcycle roads, yeah. uh, great motorcycle life. Yeah. I see Albert's driving. I did a Zoom I for work. I did a Zoom for work the other day from my motorcycle. It caused quite a bit of <laughs> disruption. I'm sure it did. Had the, had the phone mounted on the handlebar and everybody about lost their mind when I started moving. <laughs> <laughs> presumably you could not hear them or could you? Did you have speakers in your helmet or something? I have a center unit on my helmet so I could hear them. Good, good. That's interesting that you called it Senna. That's what we call it over here. But I've heard quite a few people from the US calling it Cena. So I'm yeah, not sure. I don't know why I call it that. Yeah, well, it's good for I'm me. I'm not sure it's well defined. No, no. Is it <laughs> Santa or Cena? I've heard both, but yeah, so I've I've never heard Santa. Potato, potato. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and how about you, Davis? Can you hear us? Where are you? Uh, I'm in UK currently, but I have been hearing your stories and they're fantastic. So oh, I'm looking forward for this one. Good. So this isn't the first time you've heard one of my talks, is that right? Uh, I, I did hear about the America trip, which you did. That was fantastic. Oh, good. Yeah, good. That was a lot of fun, that trip. Yeah. What David, for the rest of you, what Davis is uh, talking about is I did a uh, 21,000 mile ride around the USA um, back in 2010. So I was giving a talk, I've given a few talks on that one um, uh, on Zoom just to uh, tell people what I saw and what I thought of riding around the US for four and a half months. Which was a lot of fun, a great deal of fun. And that was pretty much unplanned or... Or was there planning involved? Uh, there was some planning. I planned about um, 13,000 miles of it, put that into my GPS system. So I did a further 8,000 unplanned miles, just wherever I fancied going at the time. So, yeah, it was pretty, pretty much planned. Yeah. And, and, and when you planned it you i mean you did a lot of uh new england blah blah and then you went across the center of the u.s didn't you yeah started in new england um and i did about a month up in the new england states and across the uh, great lakes went out to chicago you know illinois minnesota went to the harley oh, okay um, so then you were up north but yeah yeah and then went across to South Dakota, Sturgis, Yellowstone, and then down the Rockies into Colorado. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you did all right. 
Yeah, and then uh, I think I did 6,000 miles in California or something like that. It was, uh, uh, it was getting, so basically I did top right-hand corner of the U.S. to bottom left-hand corner. Uh, I've never, I've not been to California. Hmm. I've been close. Yeah, it's, um, California was good. I liked it. My favorite area was Northern Arizona and Southern Utah. And there are several ingredients in the atmosphere that have not yet come together. We'll have to watch and see if they do come together, or if we get any storms to fire. If there are storms, the strongest are likely Somebody's got their mic turned on, which sounds like their TV is on. Not mine. Oh, that's better. Hey, Jeff, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good, good. Where are you, Jeff? Brighton. Brighton? Oh, you're, you're, you're over here. Exactly. Yeah. I'm northwestern Pennsylvania, by the way. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I've been to Pennsylvania, but only for a handful of miles. I just clipped, I think I clipped the top left hand corner, the top northwestern corner. Erie. Yeah. On 90. I can't remember. Yeah, if you come out of the Buffalo area and head west on 90. Go right through Erie. Go over to Cleveland. Yeah, that's exactly what I did. I was riding along the coast, and Pennsylvania just goes in, goes in, not the coast, the lake. So, yeah. 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 I've been with people and rode to Lake Erie because it's only like two hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, they've not, not left the hills very often. Yeah. And when we got to Lake Erie, they thought it was the ocean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, should we make a start? I'm, uh, I'm aware of uh, people's time, so um, I'm going to kick off and just do a quick introduction uh, before starting the uh, the talk itself. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this online talk about motorcycle touring in Europe, uh, designed for mainly Americans, this talk, to have some sort of an idea about what it's like to ride in Europe. And I want to give you a flavor of that to you know, show you, what, you know, where you might go, show you some pictures, you know, to give you a, an idea of you know, what it's like over here. And like in the US, uh, Europe is currently going through a lockdown at the moment. Uh, we're all, each country's in sort of various different stages, like I think you are in the US. Uh, and here in the UK, we've only just um, uh, being able to start riding again, but only two people together at a time at the moment. Um, so, of course, what we're hoping for is the quickest possible end to this pandemic so that um, we can start getting out there and finding uh, new ways of um, coping and how we're all going to deal with uh, the, the, you know, the new way of life, whatever that is. And um, so that's why I started doing these talks just to connect with other motorcyclists around the world and you know in Europe, and I think this is number talk number fourteen. So they're going reasonably well, and I'm quite enjoying them. I think um, I think I'm going to carry on doing them after the uh, after the pandemic's finished. Um, what I will do is I'm going to share my screen with you when I start talking uh, the presentation, and I will mute your microphones so that we lose the background noise. I think that's the best way of doing it. That, of course, means that you won't be able to ask any questions along the way, uh, and I won't be responding to any, um, to any uh, notes that you type, because being a typical man, I can only do one thing at a time, so I'll be concentrating on talking. So I think the, um, so just hold any questions you've got until the end of the talk, and we'll um, have a chat then. I think the talk will take about 40 minutes, something like that, plus some time for questions, so we'll see how we go. Uh, during the talk, you should be able to see my little talking head in the top right-hand corner or somewhere on your screen. You can make that bigger or smaller um, you know, in relative to the slides that you're going to be seeing. Uh, you won't be able to see each other, but we'll return to this view at the end. So um, without further ado, I think we should start. I've just got to do a couple of things here. So let me just first of all turn off your mics. Um, that'll be slightly easier okay. 
Okay, so your mics have gone off. I'll share my screen with you. And I'm going to do one more thing um, if I can. It doesn't always work very well. There you go. So you should just be able to see my head in the top right hand corner now and we'll make a start. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, in three sections. I'm going to talk about where you could go, you know, where are the best places to ride in Europe. Uh, John, who is online, has been on one of a, you know, a trip with me, so he, he will know some of what I'm going to talk about. So part one is where can you go? Part two is what is it like riding in Europe? And part three is just a little bit, give you an idea about what some of our tours are like. Um, because you know, I'm a Harley Davidson authorized tour operator, so we run tours in, in Europe. Um, so a little bit about me first, um, I'm an avid motorcyclist. I started riding when I was 17 years old, um, uh, but then, um, you know, like many young men, I um, uh, stopped riding motorcycles when I got married and had children and had to buy a more practical car. But I've now been riding Harleys for about 15 years. And as I was saying, I did a 21,000 mile ride around the US. It was actually a uh, retirement present to myself. And um, I wrote a book about that. Uh, I do some of these talks specifically about that uh, trip, if you ever want to uh, catch up with one of those talks. Um, I've ridden in 28 different countries and 29 different states in the US. So I fully appreciate just how fortunate I am to have had you know, such a wide experience of riding right around the world. And in 2013, I set up a Harley Davidson motorcycle touring company called Tour One. And uh, we now primarily run uh, tours in Europe. And I think I've done about 50. So I've designed about 50 tours and, and either led them or organized them. So I know a bit about motorcycling and touring. So where could you actually go to ride in Europe? Well, we were talking about it earlier about the relative size of the USA and Europe. And for, I apologize for those of you in Canada, but I just- oh, Turn off, wait a minute. Uh, was that you, Jan? My radio will turn off. Uh, I'm sorry. Jan, if you could mute your mic, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Wait. So the relative size of the USA and Europe, there they are side it's, by side. Let me see, I'm turning it off and it won't turn off. Let me call you back. It's, okay, I'm in the car, something's happening here. Bye. Um, so the relative size of uh, Europe and the USA, if you load overlaid uh, Europe on the USA, they're broadly the same sort of size, but... Um, that's not the main area of interest for motorcyclists. The main place that we ride uh, is in Western Europe, not so much in Eastern Europe. Uh, so where are the best places to ride you know, in Europe? Well, there are so many places, so much culture and so much great scenery. It's a bit like how diverse the USA is. Europe is just as diverse. So here are my favorite places to ride. Um, so there's an overall map of Europe. The nearest to where we live in uh, London by that red dot, uh, the nearest mountains are the Vosges Mountains in Eastern France. There's some good riding there. There's some fantastic riding in the French Alps, uh, some great mountain passes down in Southeastern France, but we, we can only ride there in the summer and the, the Col de Lisseran is the highest paved road in Europe, so we are uh, trying to uh, ride that as often as we can. Another good place is the Lower French Alps, where there's some fantastic gorges and some low hill, low mountains, tall hills, I would call them. And of course, that can be combined with riding in places you know, on the coast, such iconic places like Monaco, Nice, and Saint Tropez. Uh, the Benelux countries in southern Belgium, Luxembourg, and the mountains in the Ardennes, which is a huge. Uh, forested area are wonderful to ride in uh, and the Black Forest I'm sure you've heard of the Black Forest in southwestern Germany uh, is stunning to ride in again it's not mountainous but it has big hills and uh, it has a very famous road called the B500 
which um, is probably as famous in uh, Europe as, say, the dragon's tail is in uh, North America. Uh, there's a Rhine, there's the Rhine Gorge. There's a section about 50 miles long of uh, the River Rhine, and it's formed a gorge um, about 300 feet deep. And uh, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it has castles that go back for hundreds of years built along the top of the, uh, the gorge. That's pretty stunning to look at. Not many people go north in Europe. Um, not, one of the best, you know, because people like going south towards warmer weather, uh, but one of the great places to go is Norway, um, where the coast road and the fjords that they have, the scenery is just amazing. But um, you're taking your chances with the weather and it's very expensive. Uh, the Czech Republic is very good, particularly in the east of the country where there are mountains. And you can combine that with places like going to see uh, Auschwitz, the, uh, um, the prisoner of war camp from World War II. A lot of people go and see that chilling place to go, but that's just over the border in Poland. But by far my favorite uh, place to go uh, in Europe to ride is the Alps. Uh, riding in the mountains themselves in uh, Switzerland, Austria, northern Italy. Yeah, the Dolomite Mountains are fabulous. The mountain passes are just wonderful. Um, it's a great combination of um, tremendous riding and fantastic scenery. Um, I absolutely love riding there. Uh, if I was to select one road, just one, that's probably my favourite all all time road anywhere in the world just if it was limited to one road it will probably be the coast road in croatia i'll show you some pictures of it later it's like um it's like the pacific coast highway in california but on steroids it's much twistier much more technical to ride and it's got beautiful uh deep blue azure uh color of the uh, adriatic ocean next to it Tuscany is fantastic. That's a great combination of uh, a lot of culture, great food, fabulous riding and scenery. Uh, right over in Romania, it's a very long way to go. It's actually a bucket list item for me. I've, I've personally not been there, but the mountains in central Romania are fantastic. It's got a road um, known as one of the best motorcycling roads or driving roads in the world called the Transfigaration Pass. And uh, I certainly want to go there one, one year. The mountains between France and Spain called the Pyrenees, fabulous riding. Northern Portugal and central Spain uh, are wonderful places to ride. From the UK, we tend, we tend to go on a ferry to get there. It's a 24-hour ferry, but it saves a, a long, long ride down through the not so more, uh, more interesting parts of France. Uh, the um, Normandy is very good. Uh, we do a D-Day landings uh, tour to go and see the beaches and the sites of um, uh, from uh, D-Day at the beginning of the uh, uh, major offensive to reclaim Europe from the Germans. And one of the best places to go is Ireland. Uh, it's stunningly good uh, riding the Wild Atlantic Way on Ireland's west coast is just beautiful. So there's lots of places that you can go in, uh, in Europe. Um, here are some photos of some great places to ride. Um, just to give you by way of example, what's it like? So the Black Forest and the Rhine Gorge, uh, very twisty roads, beautiful scenery, some pretty stunning, that's the B500 road that I was talking about. Some tremendous roads set in wonderful settings. Um, Throughout, throughout the area, some tremendous twisty roads. Uh, this is the River Rhine itself, and this is the Rhine Gorge with one of the castles sitting atop it. Um, it's a great place to go. Uh, the Alps themselves, probably, you know, as I said, my favorite area of anywhere to ride in uh, Europe. This is uh, Splugen Pass on, uh, in Italy. This is in the Dolomites, you know, some tremendous roads. Um, this is, um, that's in Switzerland. Um, yeah, it's just a great combination of fantastic scenery like this and wonderful riding. 
that's one of the ramps, one of the sides of Stelvio Pass. Uh, this is um, this is in Austria. Just tremendous views, fantastic riding. There's a whole group of uh, us out for a, a journey. Yeah, roads like these are you, know, you you it's the closest you'll get to the Rockies, riding in the Rockies. Um, that's uh, in Italy, and this is in southern Austria, and this is uh, Grossglockner Pass in also in Austria. This is the other side of uh, Stelvio Pass. You, know, you can just imagine riding a road like that. That road has got 70, 75 switchbacks as it goes up and then back down again. Um, a picture of my son sitting there admiring the view. Uh, Tuscany in Italy, I talked about that. This is uh, Siena, we stopped for a coffee break here. This is the wonderful city of Florence. Uh, and we do a walking tour of Florence to look at some of the art and architecture when we're there. Uh, this is Michelangelo's statue of David in, one, in the principal museum in Florence. Um, I was blown away when I first uh, walked into the museum and saw this statue. It's incredible that one person, Michelangelo, can make such a beautiful statue out of one piece of marble. Um, this lady, I'm not really too sure why she was taking this picture or she was no doubt going to send it to her friends, but she concentrated on something, one area. That's the Ponte Vecchia Bridge. And this is um, um, Venice. Um, so that's uh, St. Mark's Square. This is the Grand Canal and Rialto Bridge. And this is the Bridge of Sighs that connects uh, the courthouse on the left with a prison on the right. Uh, absolutely stunning architecture. So a good combination in Tuscany and that part of Italy of great riding and wonderful places to see. Uh, Ireland, this might surprise you a bit. There's some wonderful, wonderful riding in Ireland. Um, very remote, very quiet, not much traffic at all. These are the 12 Pin Mountains. Uh, that's um, um, Healy Pass on the Ring of Kerry. The West Coast, be absolutely stunningly beautiful, much like uh, you know, some of the West Coast of the US. That's a... Um, this is Healy Pass again. Um, small, quiet, great riding. Um, not always the best of weather in Ireland because it faces the Atlantic, but um, here's, a whole, here's a group of people who absolutely loved it um, and the wonderful riding in Ireland. Uh, the Pyrenees Mountains I mentioned between France and Spain. Uh, and again here, it's a combination of wonderful scenery and great riding, twisty roads. Obviously the mountains, we were talking about Colorado earlier, the mountains are not nowhere near as tall as in Colorado, but they're just as much fun. Um, some beautiful lakes, that's a hotel that we use, we have that dedicated to ourselves, and we have some great food uh, when we eat in those restaurants as well. Uh, Central Spain, Again, so much culture, so much to see, as well as fantastic riding on roads like those. You know, again, low hills, not big mountains, but um, pretty hot. There it is, nearly 100 degrees. That's uh, Ronda down in the south a bit. This was a group we took right down to the south. And, uh, and finally here, some pictures of some uh, great mountain roads. You, we can really open up and use our... Harley Davidsons to their fullest extent. I talked about Croatia and that one great road along the coast. Well, here's some pictures of it. Um, it is very twisty, a beautiful road surface, wonderful ocean that's generally very hot because it's the Adriatic. Um, it's not like the Pacific Coast Highway, which is quite cold. And these are some of the places that we see. Um, and you know, how could you not? love riding a road like that. We actually get a ferry across from Croatia to Italy on part of one of our tours, so that's a lot of fun. So what is riding in Europe like? Yeah, I've shown you quite a few pictures. What is it actually like? Um, well, weather-wise, this is what the summer temperatures and weather you could expect. In sort of the UK, you can expect a high of about 60 to 70, <laughs> cloudy, 
sometimes sunny, but as you go further south, France and Germany, 70 to 80 degrees, uh, Spain, Switzerland, the Czech Republic, those sort of places, and southern Germany, 80 to 90, and then as you go further south, 80 to 100. So in the summer, fabulous weather. That's obviously the best time uh, to ride. Um, generally, how do the roads compare in Europe to the US? Generally, the roads are narrow and slightly smaller in Europe. Um, and lots of the roads were laid out before there were cars. They were based upon horse and track routes, so they don't make an awful lot of sense. They're not particularly straight, which is good if you're on a motorcycle. And like in the US, um, you, you don't really want to ride a motorcycle in cities. So obviously, the because cities get quite busy and we uh, tend to prefer riding outside of cities. Uh, we ride on the right side of the road everywhere in Europe apart from in the UK. When we run a tour in the UK we generally, because people uh, from outside the UK are not used to riding on the left, we, we meet them where they pick up the rental bikes and we escort them the, the 20 or 30 miles to, the, uh, to where we get the ferry across to um, or the train across the sea. There are few road grids, like a lot of Cities and large towns in the US have a very regimented grid of roads. This is Albuquerque. You don't tend to get that in Europe. Uh, it's much more chaotic and demands the use of a GPS a lot more because you cannot find your work out your way around a lot of towns and cities, um, mainly towns, uh, just by the logic of the road numbering system because there isn't one. Um, so is it different riding uh, in the US to Europe? Well, about 90% of it, I would say, is the same. You know, if you're used to riding in the US, you're very, you, you'll find it very easy riding in Europe. This is an interesting one. A lot of Americans who first come to uh, the UK, uh, sorry, come to Europe, say that they don't want to do lane splitting uh, because they've seen the videos or they've seen lane splitting in California and they just don't like it. Then after riding and doing some lane splitting, every American that then goes back home says, oh, I wish we could lane split. It's so good. It saves so much time. You know, we obviously we all do it very safely and not really like they do on the uh, interstate in California. We do it very in a much more considered way. Um, like in the US, some countries have different riding laws or driving laws. And um, so, and we have some unusual road signs in Europe that you really need to know about. Um, we teach uh, everybody about those before they come. Uh, we have a lot of roundabouts. We love roundabouts. We don't like uh, two-way, three-way or four-way stops because we can get moving much quicker. And one big difference I found, I think, uh, let me check this with you at the end. I think you, you do a lot of navigation in the US by road numbers. You, know, you go down I-5, you turn left on Highway 38, you're in 20 miles, and then you go onto State Road 42. We don't do any of that. In Europe, we tend to navigate um, by just by using town names. We do have numbers, all the roads do have numbers, but we navigate by places. So that is, that's a bit of a difference. And we have a much more, as I showed on the map, a much more, I think, more generally more complex road system. There are many more and they don't, you know, lots of them are not straight, like quite a few in some areas in the US. So a GPS is pretty essential if you're going to ride in Europe. The number of miles that you can do each day in Europe tends to be less as well uh, because of those complexities of the roads. Meal times tend to be a different. We tend to eat quite a lot later in the evening in Europe than, uh, than perhaps quite a few people do in Europe. Uh, there are some different laws in different countries. I won't even try and uh, explain them all now, uh, but we, we, on our website, we have a guides, a motorcycling guide section. And one of the things in there shows all the different riding laws for different countries. So wherever you're going, it's always worthwhile having a quick check and a, just to make sure that you understand they're not that significant. Um, we, as I said, we have some unusual road signs uh, that you 
don't have in the US and we don't even have these in the UK. So these mean different things about rights of way and who has to give way at various junctions. So it's important that you learn those. Again, we have, you know, if you're ever going to come to Europe to ride, have a look on, a, on our website because you, know, you can learn about these. There are not that many. You need to know about three or four, and that's the really important ones. Um, of course, how you want to do your motorcycle touring and your approach to it makes quite a big difference on the sort of tour that you will end up doing because there are many different types. Some people love riding just with groups of friends. Some prefer to ride on their own. Some people just want to get somewhere quickly. You know, maybe if they're going to an event like a rally, some people want to take a lot more time and really enjoy the best roads on the way. Um, some people want to combine it with seeing places like you, know, like Florence or Venice or places like that, because then in not so much of a rush. Uh, most people want to avoid the big cities and stay in more remote places. Um, I did have one group, a private group from Indonesia. All they wanted to do is stay in big cities and go shopping. It was, um, well, they enjoyed it. I'm not sure that I did, though. Um, some people like to do a lot of planning. Some people like to completely wing their tours and do no planning at all. We were talking about this uh, with John just at the beginning when, uh, this evening. I've done both, you know, and you can do both uh, when you're in Europe as well. Uh, some prefer camping and some like to stay in hotels. And some people had no time at all to do any planning, so they tend to go on an organised tour with a company like ours. So all of that sort of has a big impact on the type of touring that you can do and how you would arrange it in Europe. Uh, this is a big question. I'm often asked this, how far can I ride in a day? Um, the simple answer is not as far as you can in the US. Because in the US, you generally have interstates, highways, state roads, local roads, and I've added mountain roads just as a by way of example. And in Europe, we have the, main, the same sort of structure of different types of roads. We have motorways, dual carriageways, primary roads, secondary roads, and mountain roads. And they're nearly all the same. You know, here's a picture of an interstate in the US compared with a, with a um, motorway in Europe. This is in Germany. And they're almost identical. Um, and the rest of the roads, you know, the highways, the state roads, and the local roads, we call them different things, but they're almost exactly the same. Uh, the one thing that is slightly different is mountain roads. I'm not sure if this is, it's wrong to generalize, but I've seen a lot of switchbacks in, particularly in the US in the Rockies that sort of look like this. They're quite wide, you know, they've um, got quite a big radius and you can even uh, drive, you know, say 18 wheelers on some of these sorts of roads. In Europe, we cannot do that. You know, um, lots of the, we call them hairpins, but the switchbacks in our mountains are much, much tighter. And you know, some of these, you, know, you can get a car around them, but not a lot else. Bikes are fine, obviously. So the approach to riding in mountains is slightly different in Europe to the US. Um, how many miles can you do? Well, it could be a little, as little as 125 miles up to 250, depending on what the roads are like. We generally plan on no more than 200, but quite often down as low as about 125 miles in a day, uh, because the roads are twistier, narrower um, than perhaps you're used to. Uh, we had a group of Americans come over, um, I'm trying to remember where they were from. And they were coming on one of our tours and they said they were going to ride around the UK for a bit before uh, joining our tour. They were going to do like three or four days. And they said, um, you know, how far can we ride? And I said, well, you won't do more than about 130, 140 miles a day. And they said, oh, we're used to doing much more than that. We're going to plan on 300 miles a day. Well, they did about 150 and then didn't go anywhere near as far as they thought. So you will do less miles per day. Accommodation in Europe, that's slightly different to um, in the US. Uh, we don't tend to have motels, but we have a lot of obviously hotels and bed and breakfast and some people like camping. But in the US, you have a lot of chain hotels like 
Best Western, Comfort Inn, Radisson, Hampton Holiday Inn that are very popular and lots of travellers stay at those. We don't tend to have those big chains. We do have some in Europe, but we have literally thousands of independent hotels that are family run and we tend to stay at those. We do have some big chains, but we tend to avoid them. We like the, uh, the individual nature of uh, independent hotels. They tend to be much better. All of our hotels are ranked one, two, three, four, or five star. Generally, I would say it's, you know, motorcyclists tend to use three star, somewhere in the middle. Um, booking ahead is probably recommended. If you're on your own, you perhaps don't need to, uh, to book ahead. But if there's a group of you, say five or six, you definitely want to, or more, you definitely want to book ahead. Um, avoid city center hotels. Most city center hotels do not have parking lots you know, because we use public transport so much that they've never been designed and we just don't have the space in Europe. Parking is pretty safe if you're in remote locations. Um, and food, because um, uh, a lot of people tend to eat in the hotels that they stay in. There's uh, not so much choice because you can be in quite remote locations in various places throughout Europe if you're really enjoying the sort of roads that I've been talking about. Uh, but room types are slightly different. Um, uh, this, if you ask for a single room, in Europe, you will get a small room like this with a very small bed in it. They tend to be a lot cheaper than other rooms. A double room might look like this. Uh, that's a typical size. The, the size of the hotel rooms in Europe are not as big as in the US. Uh, this would be a twin room with two beds, so they're quite narrow beds, not like you're used to. Um, you might get a suite, but this costs uh, quite a bit more you know, where you have a sitting area as well as a sleeping area. Uh, you have a lot of queen beds in your hotels in the US. Um, you hardly ever get this in Europe. Um, so sharing of rooms, if you have two riders sharing of rooms, they will be in single smaller beds. Kitchen areas in uh, hotel rooms are very rare, unlike some of the suites in the US. Um, and bre but our breakfasts are generally very good. Um, John, who's online, uh, uh, used to, when he came on a tour with us, he used to rave about the breakfasts. And in fact, I think it was in this hotel, John, that you uh, uh, really enjoyed them. This was um, you know, a, a full cooked breakfast with meats and cheeses is normal in, uh, in Europe. Uh, these are some of the hotels we stay at on one of our tours. And these are, I'm showing you these because these are fairly typical. That's a of the courtyard of a hotel in uh, Munich. John, you'll recognize all of these, I think, or a lot of them. This is the Geilberg Hotel in the mountains, uh, a, coast, uh, a coastal hotel in Croatia, uh, another coastal hotel in Croatia. This is a new one that we use now. The hotel is actually here right in the center of this small town. It's got an underground parking facility, so that's very good. This is in Florence, a very old fashioned historical type hotel with some great hotel rooms. This is a hotel that we use in Venice and one that we use uh, in the mountains in Austria uh, as we are returning back to Munich. Riding gear and packing is almost identical as you use in the um, USA, but you must, in every country in Europe, wear a legal helmet. A DOT helmet is fine, but not a cheap novelty or brain bucket type helmet. The, the police will just not let you wear those. Um, we tend not to wear chaps. Chaps are regarded um, as with some smile over here. Uh, they're very much an American thing. People just don't tend to use them here. Um, you must wear gloves in some countries. Always bring rain gear because you know, on, uh, wherever you go, it could rain at any time. Um, rental bikes in Europe are much, much cheaper than in the US now. Now that Harley have done that ridiculous deal with Eagle Rider and given them a monopoly, 
given Eagle Rider a monopoly and they put their prices up enormously. Rental bikes over here always include insurance and you can get the same sort of models of bikes, the same sort of range you know, to rent as you do in the US. You know, soft tails, tourers and sportsters and a few trikes, but there are far fewer places that rent bikes. So if you book early enough, you'll get the sort of model that you like. Don't leave booking your rental bike until the last minute. It just doesn't work. Uh, a lot of people from the from North America choose to fly into the UK because it's so easy. And some people spend some time visiting Ireland, Scotland, England, or just London you know, for a few days just to do some sightseeing before going on riding. And why do people start from the UK and not somewhere else? Normally, because it's easier to make the arrangements. You know, if you're coming on a, an organized tour, it doesn't matter. But if you're doing it on your own, being able to speak English is, is a great help. Um, and it's great riding from the UK south. If you think of that map that I showed you at the beginning of where are the best places to go. Well, if you think you're in London and you take the, take the channel tunnel you know, under the sea, that's easy. That takes about 40 minutes. Wherever you go, you know, you're probably going to ride some fantastic areas. So you pick, take the opportunity to ride those areas to get to your destination or to the country that you're going to ride in. It's a great help. Um, if we, as I said, if we go to Spain or to the Pyrenees, we tend to go on a boat. Um, there are some other places to rent Harleys in Europe, but not many. Uh, Munich has a good, uh, has a very good range. And there's Munich centered right close to some of the best riding in Europe. Getting to Europe, um, many US cities, you can fly direct to many European cities. And there are hundreds of flights from the US to London each day. And that's because London is a sort of a hub for onward travel throughout the world from the US. So there are lots of cheap flights because there are so many to uh, London. Yes, you obviously need your passport, but do you need a visa to come and ride in Europe? No, you don't if you're an American uh, because you know, the US and the UK have a visa waiver scheme where People from each country do not need, uh, from the UK or from America, do not need a visa to go to the other one. Uh, yeah, of course, you should allow some time in Europe before getting on your bike to overcome the time difference. Uh, it's almost impossible because of the variety of things that you could do. It's very, almost you know, the type of tour and where you go, you know, say the accommodation, the food, how long are you going to rent a bike for, the distance you're going to ride. It's impossible to give a ballpark figure. But what I will tell you is US exchange rates have never been better than to come to Europe than right now. Uh, back in two, this is comparing the US dollar and the British pound. 2014, it used to cost you about $1.70 to buy a UK pound. Now it's down to about $1.15. That's all you need to spend to buy a pound. So your money goes a lot further and it's exactly the same with euros. Back in 2014, it was about $1.40. It will cost you to buy a euro. Now it's as down as little as about $1.20. So you know now is a pretty good time you know, with the dollar being so strong to come to to come and ride in Europe. Uh, it's cheaper, as I said, to rent bikes in Europe than the USA. Accommodation, you know, it's anywhere from about seventy dollars upwards. You know, you can pay hundreds of dollars, but you know, normally hundred to hundred and fifty dollars in that sort of range for a pretty good hotel anywhere you know in uh, in Europe. Food, there's you know, um, food's probably a bit more expensive because you know, not many people will eat fast food and cheap food. You know, people mainly stay in their hotels. Tipping is absolutely optional. Fuel is more expensive in Europe. You know, you're very lucky to have relatively cheap fuel in North America. So finally, just show you some pictures of some of our tours. Uh, what's the time? Okay, I'm taking a bit longer than I thought. We categorize our tours in three ways, easy riding, moderate riding, and challenging riding. Our easy riding tours are normally about four days. They don't go very far, maybe France, Belgium, or Luxembourg, and they tend to visit places like 
as I said earlier, the D-Day landings, beaches. And moderate riding tours are six to 12 days, go a bit further into Italy, Austria, Croatia, or Germany. More comfortable riding, and um, an example of that is our castles and chateaus tour. But our challenging riding tours, which are probably much more fun, much more enjoyable, uh, these go into the mountains, either in the Alps or the Pyrenees, and these are all about the riding. So let's just have a quick look at D-Day Landings Tour, show you some pictures. Uh, this is just four days, and we literally, we go, we go from Portsmouth across to uh, Normandy, and we go and see all of the beaches and the principal sites for, from D-Day. This is Omaha Beach during uh, the D-Day, on D-Day, and that's what it looks like today. This again is Omaha Beach at its western end that was scaled by the Rangers. Uh, this is uh, Pegasus Bridge uh, back on D-Day and what it looks like today, almost identical. Uh, we're going to see a few German uh, gun emplacements and some of the defenses that they put up along the sea. Uh, this is where the uh, American parachutists landed and they featured that uh, um, church in the film, The Longest Day. And we go and see lots of tanks and memorials few museums as a Harley WLA in one of the museums. Uh, Harleys were actually used during D-Day or just after it. So we go and see a lot of great places that evoke a lot of history. And of course, we on the top of Omaha, on the bluff over Omaha Bridge, we go and see the American Cemetery, a very, very moving place. Uh, the Castles and Chateau Tour, this is a six day tour and it just goes into um, it just goes into Belgium and Luxembourg. And this is about a bit more luxury. We stay at some fabulous castles and uh, chateau. Uh, that one's in Luxembourg. This is riding through the Ardennes forest. Fabulous riding. This is a, um, a chateau that we stay at in Belgium. The scenery is pretty cool. Uh, that's in Germany. This is the Domaine de Ronchine chateau that we stay in. Uh, this is a town called Vianden in Luxembourg that we go and see. One of the rivers that we ride along. There's some riding in, on a typical road in France. That one's quite straight. This is at Bestone where the Battle of the Bulge took place. Uh, another river that we ride alongside. And this is an old fort. That is in fact a hotel. That part of the fort has been turned into a hotel and we stay there. Quite a cool place to say. And finally, our Altitudes with Attitude Tour, a bit more serious riding in the mountains. We start in um, the south of England and we ride all of those great places to get to the Alps. Um, this is probably our one of our uh, more prestigious tours. And you've seen some of these photos already. These are actually taken on our tour, on our Altitudes with Attitudes Tour. So there's you know, a couple were over this and Stelvio Pass. Uh, this is Grossglotner Pass, a group that we took out. And that's about a typical number of bikes that we take, about 10 to 12, something like that. Um, this is fantastic riding, one of my favourite areas in the Dolomites. Yes, we ride that road. Um, beautiful. Furka Pass in Switzerland. This is all on one tour. And yet we ride that as well. Um, so... Um, yeah, we have some places available on some of our tours in 2021, not, not many. We only have one room left for our tour next year, the Altitudes with Attitude Tour. We have uh, three rooms left on our D-Day Landings Tour. And we have three rooms left on our Castles and Chateaus Tour. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, we're nearly full for next year. Uh, but in... Um, in about two to four weeks, we're going to announce our 2022 tours. So I'm quite excited about that. I'm probably going to do that on Zoom. So if you ever want to have a look at our website to have a look at any of our tours, it's tour1.com. Nice and easy to remember. So that's it. I'm going to turn off that presentation, stop sharing the screen, and see uh, if you've got any questions. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? I didn't know you were there. <laughs> oh, let me turn your microphones back on.
why can I not unmute you? Hang on a second, that's not working. I can unmute myself. Okay, can you all do that? For some reason, I cannot unmute you as a group. Check, check, check. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Oh, good, cool. So that, that's a sort of a flavor of, um, you know, riding in Europe and, you know, what you could do and some of the places you could go. It's, um, there's quite a wide variety there. And, um, um, you know, it's a, it's a great place to come and ride. It's quite different from the US. And um, uh, see Steve's there, he's, he's ridden on, the, you know, on a couple of our tours here in Europe and John's there, he's ridden on one and leaf as well so have you got any questions about uh, any of that gary give us give us in general the the feeling on tipping in europe i've been in a couple of situations where it got a little uncomfortable because i wasn't sure um tipping is never compulsory in europe uh, it's always discretionary some places add it to the bill but you don't have to pay it most places don't add it and so if you, if you enjoyed the service and you think it was good, you know, add no more than 10% on. Um, that will be normal if the service was good. I normally do tip, but you know, quite a few people don't. You know, it depends what it was like. You know, um, but unlike in, the, in North America or in the US, you know, the, the waiters and waitresses are paid a reasonable wage and they don't rely upon tipping to really make up their salary they're paid a proper wage so tipping is an extra sometimes you know in some countries like germany if you tip um you know some some people get quite embarrassed because they say no 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 i don't want to tip you know that you you don't need to do that so it's quite different right. yeah we have a minimum wage now don't we which is a, a living wage so that they're not allowed to pay below the minimum wage so everyone gets a reasonable salary yeah yeah which has made a big difference yeah yeah so have any of you um I know john you know you recognize a few places there no doubt um you know john um uh was one of our uh tour you know came on one of our tours and i won't put words in your mouth john what did you think of riding in europe uh the only thing that sucked about it is the time between the left and you come back. <laughs> I thought it was fabulous. The, the thing that uh, impressed me the most about riding in Europe rather than the U.S. is architecture, uh, infrastructure. Uh, you have to really, I get a sense. You know, when you, when you tour the U.S., you're talking a couple hundred years. When you tour Europe, you're talking thousands of years. So it's different. I, I mean, it was just, it was a life's ride for me. I loved it. It was, and Gary's planning, that's, that's something I never did before. Just, you know, poke and hope, go. You got 10 days, get and come back and whatever happens happens but uh, the planning was the most enjoyable thing about it the fact that i didn't have to do any and and uh, it was a very enjoyable ride uh, the riding distances every day are shorter but i found it to be more relaxing and 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 there's days in between i think two of them where we stayed in the same place for two nights and you, you you think, oh wow, wasting all that. But no, it's it's relaxing. Uh, good trip. Highly recommend it. Good, thank you, John. Um, yeah, the um, I think you're right. You know, it is um, there is quite different riding in Europe, and Steve will probably agree with this as well. I'm sure Steve's done a couple of trips. You know, it, um, being able to be on a tour that you know somebody shows you around and you don't have to think much you know, um i think is quite relaxing for people you know, uh, you, know, you, the, you know if you have an experienced tour leader who's been to these places before you know and knows where all the best photo stops are and good coffee stops and things like that i think that helps a lot you know you don't have to do so much guesswork um, but um 
and I think the the culture that you were talking about and the architecture does go back many 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 hundreds of years you know I uh, I took somebody to my local pub you know um, down the road here and it was built about a thousand years ago or the church opposite was you know and, and they just stood there and you know in absolute amazement and you know how can it be that old and it just is you know yeah. Do you still do the ride along the Rhine River in Germany? Yes. Do that every year. I, I that that was very impressive. Yeah. Uh, the, and that took you pool. back a thousand years. Yeah. I mean, just cruising up that valley. That was that was great. Yeah. That's a uh, that's an amazing road. We you, I don't think you rode that one, Steve, when we went there. Um, did we? The the Rhine Gorge. I don't believe so. No, I don't think you did that one, no. Yeah. No. Jeff, how much riding in Europe have you done? Um, a fair bit. A fair bit. I've been down to, I've done Farkasay, so mainly for rallies. I've done Farkasay and Monte Gordo, uh, places like that. Um, we're going down next year to Potros. Yeah. So I've done a bit. Um, but I've never organised it for other people before, and as a, uh, I mean, as part of uh, the club I'm in, um, there's only six of us going. Yeah. Um, but I've never really done the Black Forest in Germany or any of that side of it at all. So I'm really just picking your brains really for that way down. Oh wow! To get to get to Portoroz in Slovenia, you know, if you've got six or seven days to get there, you can do some of the best riding in Europe. You know, some of those areas that I talked about, you. Know, you can go through all of that to get to Portrose. You you head south, and then you and then you head east to you know, through yeah. the Alps into uh, Portrose. It's fantastic. That's I was sort of planning to go down um, to the lakes really, and go across through the Italian lakes, um, and then come back via Vienna um, and the Eagle's Nest and all that on the way back. Yeah, yeah, I would personally. I wouldn't go down as far as the uh, the lakes. I would start heading east before then, because you're getting into the slightly flatter parts of northern Italy. Yeah. And if you go through the Dolomites, stunning, absolutely stunning riding there. Yeah, it's beautiful. So uh, yeah, a second. I'm going with Tony and Penny, who have been with you. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. The Dolomites are good, aren't they, Steve? No, oh, fantastic. <laughs> I would go back in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. 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 How are we doing for time? That's about, it's just gone eight o'clock. So, uh, so we're on about an hour. That's not bad. Yeah. yeah. Well, Gary, I'll make one comment. I've organized quite a few rides in the States with friends and stuff, even up to six week rides. But going over there and riding with you was phenomenal. I didn't have to worry about a thing. I had my wife with me. It was very enjoyable pleasant run for her so it was uh in the uh and the uh the views just were outstanding <laughs> took our breath away so and i live in colorado so it, it's uh, that's saying something it was very nice yeah well yeah and what, um, steve was i right about the switchbacks that they tend to be a bit wider and a bit easier in uh, in colorado for example oh, definitely yeah, I can, I mean, I can find roads here that are tight, you know, like some of the passes, but in general, you're, you're totally right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, in the States, we make a big deal out of, uh, oh, something like Deal's Gap, you know, the tail of the dragon. That's nothing. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it's really. a fun ride, don't get me wrong, but. It's, uh, it's a to, lot of twisties. It's yeah. a lot of twisties. 319 turns in 11 miles, something like that, but none of them are like riding Stelvio or any of those. No, passes. no. And, and what, yeah, that because they're not in those mountains, you know what yeah. I mean? The yeah. hills there, the hills there, are, you know, generally right around 3,000 feet. They go up higher and, and whatnot, but it's, but it's twisty and curvy, and that ain't the only twisty and curvy road. You hang right. out in that area, man. They're all that way. I was you down betcha. there, and I met a guy from Nebraska. Now you know what Nebraska looks like, right? I live this right next to him. This guy comes over from Cigarette from Nebraska, and he says, 
hey, can I bum a cigarette? Yeah, sure, go ahead. He goes, well, I don't know about you boys, but I'm about ready for some straight roads and some cornfields. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a ton of them. There. The, the, it's the mountains, you know, that's what makes it, uh, it's just different. I, I, uh, I was in Europe, in Northern Italy and uh, flew over the Alps and uh, stayed up in Northern Italy and uh, I always said I would ride my motorcycle in Europe one day. 15 years later, I went with Gary. So, did you do, did you do I, I, do, I might go again, Gary. Take, may, I might give the, another couple uh, years off to, you know, kind of settle down a little bit and then I'll. Did you do the altitude with attitude? Yes. Good. Great run. Yeah, that's a good run. Yeah. Good run there, yeah. I always thought about, had, you know, I had a going group by of guys. myself, but I haven't done it yet. Well, then I had a group of guys that we wanted to tour the UK, so Gary put together a trip uh, yeah. just yeah. for that. Uh, that was really oh, okay. nice. Cool. Yep. Yeah, we do uh, we do private tours for groups if, if people want to do it, and uh, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, we saw a lot of, well, even I saw a lot of places in the UK that I'd never been to. So uh, that was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two weeks. Yes. And then you'll have to set a photo. That's a good run. Yeah. Yep. Did you run into a lot of rain or was it fairly decent? Very little, really. We, yeah. we put the rain gear on, uh, oh, three, four days, but I would say half day at most. It, it, really, the weather was fantastic. Except in Scotland for the... Um, uh, when we went to see the, uh, oh, what was it? Yeah, uh, the tattoo was awesome. The tattoo, but we sat yeah, in the, the military tattoo. Yeah. So we yeah. sat in the pouring rain for a couple of hours. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, look, yeah, yeah, it's um, it's yeah, we've done nearly an hour now, so I think we should call it a day. It's been great to see you, um, Jeff. If you need. Uh, if you is that your dog's, dog's talking? Dog? <laughs> so, Jeff, you know, if, if you need some advice, oh, it's your dog. Uh, yeah, yeah, look. yeah, look, yeah. Get in contact with me if you want some help on a couple of routes, Jeff. I'll, I'll you. help you out. Uh, Steve and uh, John, it's been uh, great to see you. And Leaf, if you're still there, for sure. Yeah, it's um, it's been a uh, pleasant seeing you all, and uh, I wish you well through the rest of your lockdown and. Uh, Hope that you all stay safe and uh, can get out and do a bit of riding soon. Um, I actually haven't ridden a motorcycle this year, so uh, Ooh. yeah. Ooh. So uh, um, I've been uh, trying to do something about this old waistline. Been trying to flatten my curve by riding a push bike. So, uh, <laughs> so are you doing any American tours at all? I, we used to do American tours. We used to do Northern Arizona and Southern Utah um but um to be honest jeff um we did that for a couple of years but then when the motorcycles rental in the u.s became so yeah. expensive it took quite a lot of the fun out of it you know because we had to charge or we would have had to charge so much more it's it's ridiculous now you know renting a bike in the u.s it's uh, scandalous what um um what eagle rider have done so um so the simple answer is no. I might do it again, but I need to get some, build up some enthusiasm to do it again. I do love it. I, I love those areas. And uh, the people who came on those tours absolutely loved them. Um, you know, both riding in the deserts and um, you're going to see you know, places like Monument Valley. It's just amazing. Yeah. Las Vegas. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we went to Vegas. They've got a huge rental fleet there, which had just come in, and they were starting to push them all out and sell them all. And I actually thought, I've got a friend in Colorado, and I actually thought it might be worth buying one and getting them to look after it. But by the time you sort out insurance and all the rest of it, it works out just too complicated. Yeah. Because you're non-resident, and getting insurance when you're non-resident other than through a dealer and stuff is... There is only there is one company in the US that you can get uh, insurance for as a, uh, as a foreigner. It's called Motorcycle Express, and they're out of North Carolina. It's the only people that will rent 
um, sorry, that will insure a foreigner without a US address on their own motorcycle. The only one. Right. Yeah. Okay. So have you got a pen pen or something? Or a pen? Uh, pen? All right, so, well, great to see everybody. Let's call it a, let's call it a day.